back everybody to another exciting Lord Duckman production. This 1972 square back that you see right here is about to get the front suspension lowered on it. Right now it's sitting at what I think is approximately stock height. We're going to bring that down roughly two inches for what I call a tasteful lower. And what I mean by tasteful is that it looks good, but the car is not impractical and you can still get in driveways like this without scraping on anything. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to drop the sucker down on the front. We're going to show how it's done. It's very, very different than a Beetle, but very similar to the rear end on a Volkswagen Beetle or Type 3. Hell, even a bus. Anything that has torsion bars with splines on it, the front is just the same because these are also set up with splines. And the spline count is also the same as the rear. So if you figure you're dropping the rear one spline, you drop the front one spline, you're approximately dropping both the same amount. We're going to do the rear two in an upcoming video, not in this one. This one, the rear really doesn't need to be dropped. But we are going to remove the coilover shocks that are on here, which will bring it down some. Because this thing is an incredibly rough ride right now. The rear end is just way too stiff. And the owner of this vehicle just doesn't like that. So we'll be taking those out, replacing them with some nice stock style shocks. And we should be good to go. But let's take a message for our sponsor. Brunt Workwear. Look at these shoes, guys. These suckers are tough. They are durable. And let me tell you some stuff about them. Are you a hard worker? You know I am. You guys see me climbing on, crawling under, lifting, pulling, pushing, and chasing chickens all day long. So I only share and review product that conforms to my type of videos that I make here on this YouTube channel. So when Brunt Workwear came along and offered me a pair of proper work boots for review, I accepted, and I'm not sorry. I received a set of Perkins with composite toe a few weeks ago, and you've been seeing them in some of my recent videos. I said I'd be glad to try them if they had a size that fits me, and sure enough, I got a nice set of size 14, which run just a little big, so they fit great. So keep that in mind if you're a big fellow the same as I. As with any new shoe, you want a little chance to wear it in for a few weeks just to give the chance to break it in before you truly decide what you think. And I've got to say, these Brunt work boots have been incredible. They're solid yet remarkably lightweight. They're sturdy and protect my ankles from not only twisting, but also from getting run over by heavy machine shop equipment. And yes, that happened to me a few weeks ago before I got these, and I sure wish I had them then. But now, they've been protecting my bruises from repeated painful strikes from everyday work environment hazards. Brunt Workwear sells directly to the customer, so they have none of the markup that retail shoe stores typically do, and they offer a 30-day guarantee where you can return your purchase for a full refund. That's pretty hard to beat. Now I'm happy with these boots and you'll be seeing them in future videos, but I ask that you check out Brunt Workwear using the address found in my video description or the one you see right here on the screen, or visit bruntworkwear.com forward slash duckman10, or visit bruntworkwear.com and use the discount code duckman10 at checkout. Special thanks again to Brunt Workwear for their awesome work boots. German superpowers! Make sure you put your jack stands. Lug nuts. Okay. First thing you might notice if you've worked on a beetle before, you will see that the rotor and the caliper are identical. They're exactly the same parts. But when it comes to the ball joints and everything else on the back side here, they're all different. Inside of there, this tie rod end, looks like we got a little failure. That sucker is loose. The one over here is fine though. So I guess it needs new tie rod ends or just replace the entire tie rod. I'll get with the owner about that. This thing drives straight, it drives true, it doesn't wobble or anything, but that little sucker will show its ugly head in time, despite not having done so already. But otherwise, up to down here, I'm not experiencing any problems with bearings. <laughs> Seems to spin freely, so I'd say the bearings are in good shape. This shock absorber is going to be coming off. Two reasons. One, because, well, it's old. It's got a lot of rust on it, which tells me that it's not anything particularly new. We're going to replace it with a brand new part, and we're going to do that, of course, after we lower it. But in order to lower it, we got to get it out of the way, so it's got to come out. All right, for starters, let's get this shock out the way. One bolt on the top. And the hubcap for safekeeping. We've got 
a nut on the bottom. Um, that wasn't tight either. Yeah, that didn't give me any, uh, any aga daga 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 on the way out. Okay, I wonder what else is gonna be loose on this car. These can be a little bit of a problem to get out sometimes. <laughs> One shock out. Now I'm going to hang on to this because sometimes the new shocks don't have the right size bushings on the bottom. I can press these out and push them in the new shocks as need be, but let's get this out the way. Ow. On the back side here, there's our ball joints. There's the other one down there. Now you probably notice both the ball joints go down, unlike a Beetle where one goes down and one goes up from the bottom. These are completely down. A Volkswagen thing does that too. This was the natural evolution of a Beetle. This was supposed to be what replaced the Beetle. And unfortunately they were a little expensive, so they didn't sell a whole lot of them, and the Beetles were just immensely popular, so that's why the Beetles continued as long as they did, long after the Type 3 was discontinued. But anyway, to remove the spindle, because that's what we're going to need to lower. we got to actually re-index this arm. The top arm, I figure we discuss this real quickly, attaches to a torsion bar that goes across to the other arm, which essentially is a sway bar. These two will twist against each other, whereas this one down here has its own independent torsion bar that runs the full width of the axle beam up front. The axle beam up on the front of a Type 3 is different than uh, the torsion leaves that you'd find on a Beetle because it actually has two torsion bars and they crisscross in the middle. They actually cross. They run the full width of the uh, the beam. It's, it's quite interesting how this works. Very different than a Beetle. But anyway, we gotta remove this nut here, pop that ball joint out, remove the nut down under here somewhere. Where is it? There it is, that nut. And then pop the ball joint out. Once we get the entire spindle out of those arms, we'll swing it out of the way. We'll leave it attached to the um, tie rod end if we can. If we can, for some reason, we'll detach that and get that out of the way as well. But. Yep, that should be it. We'll take this little index off here because this is gonna be in our way. And it looks like one of our bump stops is rotten, which is a bit of a problem, I guess. But typically you'd only really be affected by that when you were to go over a speed bump really fast or jump the car because ordinarily the arm wouldn't swing down this far, especially since we're lowering it. I guess we're really not even gonna come close to it anymore. But the bump here is where it belongs and we might have to remove this to make sure that it gets as low as it needs to be. So we'll look at that when we get to that point, but we'll check. But they come off pretty easy. You just pull on them and they, they twist right off of a, a little weenie head looking thing. Trying to rip it off of there so you can show it to you. There it is. There's a little weenie head. It goes into that hole. Just presses right in there just like that. All right, well, that's out of the way. We probably don't need that anyway. Okay, let's take a little more apart here and get this right, spindle out. We and we'll show you how this works. That nut. This is a pinch nut. Actually, it's not even a nut. It's a bolt. And it pinches the spindle on that ball joint. I don't even think that I need to take the top and the bottom out, if you remember correctly. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I only had to remove one of the two, and it might have been the top one. The well, fact of the matter is, it's now loose. I bought a crowbar out here to pry it a little bit if I needed to. Yep, there it is, came out. Jeez, that was easy for a change, ain't that nice? When is anything ever easy? Oh God. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna try to lift that up and out of the way. There it is, look at that. Okay, we don't have any stress on our brake line. There's no stress on our speedometer cable. This is now ready to um, move and re-index. We have to loosen uh, the grub screw that's up under here, if you guys can see that. Now, let me show you. I'm gonna give you a different angle. Give you a different angle. I'll give you guys okay, the proper getting a good look under here. You can see that this ball joint is actually brand new. It's got a nice rubber on it. No dry rot, no cracks. Looks like somebody replaced both ball joints on it. At least on this side. I haven't seen the other side yet, so I'm not, not the least bit concerned with that. Tie rod end, however, leaves much to be desired. You can see it's dry. In fact, it's split. Yeah, I'm actually lifting it open there, so this is this is shot. I would replace that and that. In fact, replace the entire tie rod altogether. There's no reason to keep the center of it because nowadays they 
they're just cheaper to buy the whole thing. Uh, if you want to buy just the ends, I guess you could. We'll make sure the owner knows about that. But the caliper looks like it's fairly new. There's a light dusting of rust on it. Had somebody have painted these, they probably never would have rusted like that at all. But they look fairly, fairly new, fairly good. The rotors have some wear. These might be original. I can feel the lip here. So these have been driven on for quite some time. But I am looking underneath here also. We got some, uh, some of the undercoating is coming off, but I don't see any severe rust. This is where you usually get a lot of rust, so this is good. There is a, a little rust going on up here. Nothing too dramatic. Probably a good uh, wire brushing and some paint would solve that problem. Otherwise, everything under here looks pretty good. The master cylinder is way up under there. Let's see if I can give you a little more light. There you go, well, look at that. I love that exposure feature. I can't tell how old that one is because again, if you paint them, they don't rust like that. But if it's working and it feels fine and I don't see any leaks, we're gonna call that one good. So otherwise, this all looks good to go underneath here. And those suckers are expensive, by the way. They resemble a Beetle Master Cylinder, but they're not. Because you can see that one nozzle on the top there where that hose goes in that's running horizontally, it's got a 90 degree angle on it. And the other one, is at a 45, like a Beetle would have. So that must be at that angle, otherwise it will not clear the tie rods when you steer. That's just the way Type 3s work. So yeah, that is a necessary, just a necessary master cylinder. I mean, yeah, maybe you can get a Type 1 and you could replace the nozzles on it, but that's just the way it works. In addition, Type 1 also has a brake outlet on the top there that runs over to the right-hand side, and this one does not. It runs out horizontally from that side over to the right. So, yeah, those are the differences. Otherwise, they're, they're the same diameter. I mean, they are interchangeable if you can make the clearances issue. They are interchangeable, otherwise, if you can work with the clearances. So think about that if you're coming down the road. But otherwise, these Type 3 master cylinders are expensive, especially if you buy a German one. Ask me how I know, because that's what I put into Ruby. And, uh, well, needless to say, Ruby drives really well. So we're going to continue working up under here and getting this sorted out. And getting the rest of this sorted out. Okay, well, we're going to take this little indexer off because it's going to be in the way. And then we'll loosen up the grub screw, which is up under here, which is covered in a bunch of what looks like undercoating and tar and just road grime. Yeah, it's going to need to be cleaned before I can do anything with that at all. But that's got to be removed, and then this entire arm can slide off the torsion bar. Now, what happens usually is they do rust on there, so I might have to do a little bit of beating on this, so don't be the least bit surprised if i got to slam it around a bit. I'd also like to take a chisel and mark a notch in it so we know what our starting point is. So that way, if I were to pull it off the torsion bar completely and lose my index, I can always put it back to where it was so we know where we started out at. All right, up under here is the grub screw. And these are not unlike the grub screws that you find on a beetle. I'm going to take the nut off the outside of it first. I did clean off the road grime. There it is, there's a nut that comes right off of it, just like that. Grub screw on the bottom is a Allen key, 8 millimeter. I've already cleaned it out, but you want to make sure that you... Ow! Get your tool seated in there properly. <laughs> Try not to mash your finger up in the process. Okay. Well, we gotta go in there. Come on! This sucks! Okay. And then get it cranked out. There we go. One grub screw out. We also need to remove the torsion bar retaining screw which is on this, okay, this little indexer, indexer here. here that has a 15 millimeter yeah, bolt on it this actually holds in the torsion bar on the other side of the car so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this out for when we work on the other side and get this out of the way and these little parts for some reason when people lower or mess with the front suspension of tie threes they typically take these off and don't put them back on and in Ruby when I got Ruby, they were missing when I started working underneath here to lower it, but when I looked in the box full of parts that came with Ruby, there they were. So anyway, these are going to go back on. We're not going to screw with this thing, but I am going to remove this from the other side so that way we can remove the torsion bar from this side. Because these, sometimes, like I said, are so rusted that we're not going to get it free, and I don't think I'm going to get it free, as I've been just tapping on and beating on it a little bit, and sometimes you got to come in here with a hammer and a drift and... 
give the thing a little whack right in here while having somebody pull on the arm and then you can try a, a ball joint puller or something over this and just it doesn't want to let go and I figure rather than abuse it let's just turn the inside uh, one spline and go from there so we should still get the same result or pretty close to it by just doing that special pulling tool just for removing this sometimes you can even and I do this with Ruby pull it out with a claw hammer I'm not expecting anything in here to uh, to be easy I really am not <laughs> these cards are old nowadays but anyway We'll tap on it a little bit. I'll look in my um, ball joint pulling set. I have a whole bunch of different pullers and see if I got something that I can clamp around it and pull out. We've got the torsion bar retaining bolt on the opposite side, way on the other side of the car, removed. So that way these bars, which crisscross in the middle, should be now removable. And it seems like it just still doesn't want to come out. So I might have to start tapping on this thing and start beating on it a little bit. These things um, probably hasn't been removed in a long long time yeah it's coming out but it's gonna need a lot more coaxing that's for sure <laughs> yeah it's only come out a couple millimeters okay well I'm gonna make some more noise I'm gonna use a softer more gentle tool under there to get this thing um, knocked out of place and once we've got it out well then we're gonna turn it and we'll show how to I do left that. I the camera recording while I was doing this because you can see the splines are starting to become exposed there. But this arm should have been coming off of those splines or they should have been coming out together. <laughs> As I was wiggling it around and tugging on it, it, it quite to my surprise, shifted in the opposite direction of what it's supposed to. So anyway, <laughs> and the moral of the story is, well, don't turn off your camera when you're doing something that's a little difficult because weird stuff is gonna happen and there it is so anyway that's moving on the splines that's good I'll see if I can um, drive this into the arm a little further and get the arm to pull off because this is uh, it's gonna be a little frustrating here and by the way I pull the spindle off the bottom of the arm I pulled it right off that ball joint I already had the bolt released on it so I just put it up there and it's sitting on top of a uh, jack stand so as not to put stress on any of the components so it should be okay I just gently tap the torsion bar back into the trailing arm with the drift just like that and then the whole arm came off in the opposite direction which defies the laws of physics I have no idea how that could work but anyway it did and the whole arm is ready to come out is what it looks like up oh, there it is okay so there's the arm Good thing we made a mark on it because and I don't know if you guys can see it. I actually put a mark on the outside of it too. There's a mark there and there's a mark here on the arm. So what we're going to do is we want to lower it. So we want to take the arm, pull it out, shift it this way, and push it back in. We only want to go one notch, and we're going one notch on the inner because the outer is being a bitch. So pull this back out. <laughs> we're going to feel for our notches, feeling for the stock one first. There's a stock one. We're going to come back one and click into the next one. There it is. That's where we want to be. Okay, at this point we're ready to uh, push this back into where it goes, put our grub screws back on and get this sucker all reinstalled. And Boomer, what are you doing over there? He's all the way out by the mailbox. Troublemaker. <laughs> when I tighten in the bolt from the other side, by the way, it's going to suck this thing in. In fact, you know what? I'll put the bolt in on the other side and you guys can watch it happen. Right in front of your own eyes. How about Gotta go that? Get him before he gets uh, out in the street or something. Where the hell did he go? He was right here. Oh, he's all the way up there. Boomer, what do you think you are? Do you think you're Crash? This is how Crash died, you dumbass. Get your ass back in the yard. Go back in the yard. You don't belong out here wandering. You're gonna get lost, buddy. Even one of the chickens escaped a minute ago. Mama, who of course was a feral chicken that was found here in the street anyway. <laughs> Come here, buddy. I know, I closed the fence so they couldn't get out. Come here, what are you doing? All right, here's how we handle this. Boop. <laughs> All right, that should get that arm seated. We've got to put our grub screw back in the bottom here. Where's the hole for it? That's it right there. 
I'm gonna get a torque wrench out and I'll torque all this down before we finalize everything here. I don't remember what the specs are, but that's why I brought out my instruction manual. I don't try to memorize those torque specs. Just too many, way too many. For the things that I do regularly, I might, but even then I check the manual. It's just too much to remember. Oh no! Oh no! There goes my socket. <laughs> try that again. Here we go. Rub screw in. All right, it's in. And we got our grub screw retaining nut. Screws on the bottom of it. Make sure you don't cross thread it. It's an awful lot of scoongeal under there, just road grime. It makes everything a little sticky. Got the right socket. No. Where'd I put the right one? That's it. That's the one. Okay. This one here. This one here. And as I said, we're going to come back and we're going to torque this down, but for now. Oops, gotta loosen it. <laughs> oh. I loosened it too much and spun it off. Let's try that again. Good. Alright. Got my torque wrench right here. I'm gonna dial it in. I'll get it indexed to make sure that it's calibrated. I'm gonna talk about the calibration method of this. It's actually really easy. All you need is a proper hanging scale. And you can put it in a vise and you can pull against it back here. And whatever the scale says is, well, this is one foot, that's your measurement. And then I just dial it into whatever the scale says and ignore what the, uh, the measurement on the side of the wrench says because this is BS. It can be off by a lot. So, anyway. Yeah, the grub screw is 22 that. foot pounds. I already got that torqued and the nut is 29. Actually, it's already there. We're good to go. All right, fantastic. We're ready to put this spindle back on. And before I do anything else, sometimes I like to put a little bit of grease on these just to make sure that they go in. And they're looking pretty clean otherwise. I mean, these things are shiny. Ruby's are all rusty. Yeah, these look really good. They even articulate nice. Again, Ruby's were kind of crusty. So. All right, well, that's It's going to be a little tricky to get these uh, ball joint stubs back in the spindle. This is the biggest fight that I have with these whenever I put these together. And I always do one at a time because the top arm is loose, so you can play with that one. But the bottom one, you got to get in there first. It also gives you a little bit more of an ability to, you know, finagle it and, and twist it around. But you know what? Let me, let me try to give you guys a, a good angle so you can see what I'm about to do. And hopefully I'll get it on the first try. But... It's got to go in there. You can't even see it. <laughs> nope. Even when it goes, the easy way to push that anything. back in was just simply to uh, align it and then squeeze it with some channel locks and it went right in. I did put a little P blast around the joint just to make sure that it went in there, and that was quite easy. Again, nothing's rusted here, so that's very nice. Very nice. Okay, top one should be more or less the same process. Get aligned. Whoopsie. Get it aligned. I probably should put the grub screw in the bottom one before it falls apart. Well, actually, it's not really a grub screw, is it? No, it's not. It's just a bolt, like that. Put it in there by hand just to stop it from falling back apart. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and get this back into place. Going a little more. All right, it's in. Put our bolts in. Alright, and we gotta get everything torqued down. And we're gonna get these screws on the back here that holds the spindle onto the ball joints. Bolted down properly. We're gonna come back and torque them in just a minute. Now we're gonna come 
and we'll come back and torque them. All right, we're looking for 40 foot pounds. Ew, wrong size socket. All right, we're looking for 40 foot pounds. Dialed in on the wrench, calibrated. Should be good to go. We got 40, and we got down here 40. All right, good. This side is essentially done. Now I have not put the rubber gogies back on because I already know that lowering this as we've done, it's, the rubber gogies are gonna affect how low that it goes because that's what they do. They're a limiting thing. It's a little bumper, it's a bump stop. It gives it a soft cushion before you bottom it out. Since you're so much closer to bottoming out at this point, uh, well, I don't think you should put them back in. <laughs> so we're gonna leave the rubber gogies out. I'm gonna expect everything. When it's down on the ground, we get it settled and we'll see if we can actually put them in there. But I got a feeling that uh, we're not gonna want them and we're gonna need that extra amount of travel that this thing has. And if I do put them back on, there's a good possibility that I may just cut them down a little bit and just take a little bit off the gogi and shorten it up a little bit. But uh, anyway, we'll see. But otherwise, this is now on here. This wheel can go back on after we install the brand new shot. All right, we got some brand new KYB shock absorbers here. Links down below in the video description if you need to get some for yourself. These will work on uh, early Beetle front ends, link pin. They'll also work on all Beetle rear ends, as well as Type 3 front and rear ends, just the same. Now these can be a little tricky, because you have to get this little thing off, this little band, and let's see if I can get you a little better exposed here. Be a little more light. Come on now. There we go. Alright. This little band that's on here, when you pull that off, the shock starts expanding. And you gotta get that bolt in there quickly. <laughs> did I get it? I think I did. Sometimes these shocks are just very, very difficult to recompress. And then the band, which I threw it off the wrong way, is now attached to the car. So you just simply open up the seam on it, just like that. Get that garbage out of the way. And then tighten up your shock absorber. There is a torque spec on these, but these are shock absorbers. As long as you make them tight, I don't worry too much about it. It's one of those things that it's not likely to fail on you unless it's already compromised. Where's the correct tool? Well, I had it right here. I think that's the one. It is. All right. Get that tightened right back on there. There we go. And we get the bottom one. Good. All right, this side's done. Let's put the wheel back on. And don't forget, we got that little indexer removed. When we did the other side, this little guy. So we're gonna have to save that. We'll put it right here on the ground so that way we know we gotta come back to it. But that's gonna be important and crucial for the adjustment and uh, removal of the torsion bar on the other side. Here. We're not gonna torque these down just yet because we might be taking this wheel back off. We're not happy with the uh, amount that's lowered. We might come back and revisit it. sound is that I'm hearing. We have to inspect that too. All right, there you have it. Tastefully lowered. Look at that. But that's only the left side. I still have to do the passenger side or right side here in the States. It's technically right side all over the world. But yeah, as long as you drive on the right side of the road, <laughs> the drivers and passengers might be different. Over on this side, however, we still have stock height and that's going to be affecting how the other side rides. I already got the hub cap off. So we're gonna start working on this one probably tonight, start doing a little disassembly, and then tomorrow we'll finalize everything and get this thing done. And then you guys will have the video. How about that? The following day. Well, we're back. Yes, and yesterday when I popped the hubcap cover off and got started last night, I did not notice 
that the wheel bearing cover was missing. Now I looked inside of there. It looks like it's got a very minimal dust in there, I guess, you know, because it had a hubcap on it, it kept it pretty clean. But I went in the yard, I pulled up another cap. This one's a little rusty. I'll get it cleaned up, we'll get it installed on there. And that'll solve that problem. I don't see any reason to repack those bearings, however. If this were on a trailer or something, like a boat trailer that got submerged, I would say, okay, let's just take the whole thing apart and repack them. But seeing as how it still had a cover on it of sorts, that hubcap cover, for whatever it's worth, I'm going to say it's okay. Because like I said, the grease on the outside there didn't look like it was covered with grit. So anyway, we're that far along. I did get it lowered this morning. So everything's situated with that. We're going to get this thing fixed. We'll put it on. And we'll try to get some good videos um, of a walk around of this car and its new lowered stance. I mean, it looks good already. <laughs> Just wait and see when we put it all back together with the hubcap. All right, crisis averted. I found another cap out in the yard. Put a little grease in it. I should get it on there. I'm gonna have to get a block of wood for that. There we go. Look at that. Alright, there it is. Alright, torque this down to 80 foot panels. Gotta have tight lug nuts, guys. We didn't do this on the other side either yet. I stopped last night because I thought I might have to take something apart again. Alright. That sucker's on. Alright, I was just texting the owner, telling her about the tie rod on this thing, and she'd like me to replace the, uh, the ball joints and tie rod. I'm going to torque these things down anyway because we might be taking it for a test drive before the parts for that arrive. I really didn't want to change that because it's going to affect the alignment. And alignment's one thing that I'm just not capable of. I just don't have the ability to do a proper alignment. You just really can't beat the price, speed, efficiency, or accuracy of a computer alignment. So, yep, not my thing. All right, we're good. And yes. We put the little bolts back in. There's the one of them. The one on the other side. We put the torsion bar bolts back in. Here they are. There's the one of them anyway. Not much light in there. We in dark. But it's there. <laughs> there she is. Nice and lowered. Look at that. Dropped about two inches on the front. Just enough that there's no wheel tuck. So that way the tires aren't going to rub on anything when you start steering. I guess maybe if you go over some steep bumps or something. But... I think it looks really good, and I kind of like the rear being just a little bit higher. That does have coilovers on it and does ride really bad. That's incredibly rough. So we're going to pull the coilovers out, and uh, it'll drop the back down a little bit, uh, up to an inch. So it probably should even out with the front. Otherwise, we should have the same thing on the other side. i got to walk around the other side of my car over here, because... <laughs> here we go. Look at that. I gotta mow my lawn. Check that out. Nice and low. I am just very, very happy with that. Very pleased. And the owner is too. She's already seen pictures of it. She's, uh, she's happy. She's happy. Good. And now that I see both sides are now equally lowered, it did settle. And it came down a little bit from where it did last night when I only had one side lowered. So, not much. Just a little bit. I mean, fraction of an inch, but it's enough. When we start driving it around, it should, uh, should move. May come a little higher, may come a little lower. It'll settle though. It'll do its own thing. Of course, once I sit on it, it's going to drop down a little bit more. But I think it looks good. It looks good. All right. Well, that pretty much squares up. Had a lower, a Volkswagen Type 3 front end. And we'll pull apart the rear end. We're going to do some rear brakes. Uh, we're going to do some rear disc brakes on this car. We're also going to be changing out the shocks on here. We're going to pull the engine and the automatic transmission because we got to go through a bunch of things on this. This was uh, overheating pretty badly. So we got to make some changes so that way it doesn't do that anymore. So we got more updates and things to come on this. So stay tuned, guys. Lick it, like it, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to pluck the dingle bell. You get updates every time I upload a video. Check out duckshit.net for all of my different social media links. If you'd like to find links to some of the parts that I use today or some of the tools that you see me use, always check out the links down below in the video description. You can also find my wish list up there on my website, duckshit.net, because 
I have, well, parts I'm going to be ordering for some of my projects. And, of course, you know, like any middle-class American, I'm trying to come up with money because I have a budget. And if you'd like to help me with some of the projects, I'd greatly appreciate that. So check out DuckShit.net. Click the link at the top that says Wish List. It'll take you there and show you some of the things that I'm working on. And it kind of gives you a little bit of a, um, what's the word, uh, spoiler as to some of the stuff that's coming up. So you'll see some of the things that I'm ordering and that I'm working on. And people have sent things from off that list already, and stuff has already uh, gone into play. And you know what the surprise is? is it's been mostly go-kart stuff. So where's my Volkswagen people? Where are they at? <laughs> More thing of things to come. We're going to be pulling this engine out. This engine was uh, subject to being overheated on the way over here severely, and we don't know for how long it's been overheating. So I suggest that it's time to um, pull the heads out and get things torqued down because it doesn't make a rattling sound when you rev it up. When it's cold, so that's probably heads. We'll just make sure everything's tight, make everything nice. Yeah, the reason we knew it was overheating is because, look, yeah, the heater ducts are not hooked up at all. So it's blowing all the cool air out on both sides. So, yeah, it was definitely overheating. I mean, when we opened up the engine lid on this thing, when it got here, it smoked the engine, literally smoked and smelled like a hot engine. So nonetheless, if it's been overheating, we're gonna do things like check the oil, look for glitter, that kind of stuff. When the engine's out, we'll get everything torqued down properly. We'll go through everything, we'll resynchronize the carburetors. We're gonna replace this 009 distributor. And I don't care what you say, you guys, 009 distributors are crap. They don't belong in a Volkswagen engine unless it's in an industrial application, like running a generator or a compressor or something like that. 009 distributors are pretty much meant for an engine that runs at the same speed all the time. If you're stopping and going in traffic, you want a proper single vacuum dual advanced distributor, an SVDA, SVDA, or a 034 distributor. So this one is coming out. We're going to upgrade to the correct one. It does, however, have an electronic ignition, which is kind of nice, but uh, otherwise, no, it's going bye-bye. We're getting rid of that garbage. Okay, so we're going to have this thing all pulled out. We're also going to remove the heater boxes because the owner didn't use the heat anyway. They're all capped off. So that's one of the other reasons why it overheats. You can't cap those off. They have to actually let a little bit of air pass through them. That's their design. Otherwise, the heater boxes overheat, which then overheats cylinders number one and number three. So you end up with uh, yeah, just problems because it puts the heat back into the head. So we're going to make all these corrections, do some modifications, get the fuel filter out of the engine compartment. we got some things lined up, and I'm going to be pulling the transmission out with the engine because, because it is an automatic transmission, and uh, I do understand that when you pull the engine out and you try to separate it from that transmission, it's really easy to break the uh, fluid pump. And since I'm a lunk and I have not disconnected an engine from automatic transmission before. We're not going to do it in the car. We're going to get it out so that way we don't have any weird angles or any of that stuff. So I can get a good look at everything so I have an understanding firmly as to how that's going to operate. Manual transmission is done a million times, automatic. This is actually going to be the first one. First one I've ever removed it from, anyway. Otherwise, I've only ever removed automatic transmissions from cars and replaced them with manuals. I never actually put the automatic stuff back together. Not that it's that much different. It might even be a little simpler because it doesn't have a shift rod, no clutch cable. Uh, well, it does have a shift rod of sorts. Not the same kind of shift rod you guys might be thinking of. But anyway, this is the 72 square, and I guess that's it for today. So, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.